Chapter 12 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Chapter 12 Sir Henry Bessemer. A little way from London, England, at Denmark Hill, looking toward the Crystal Palace, is a mansion which is fit for royalty. The grounds, covering from 30 to 40 acres, are beautifully terraced, dotted here and there with lakelets, fountains, and artificial caverns, while the great clumps of red rhododendron, yellow laburnum, pink hawthorn, and white laurel make an exquisitely colored picture. The home itself is spacious and inviting, with its elegant conservatory and rare works of art. The owner of this house, Sir Henry Bessemer, is cordial and gracious, and from his genial face and manner, no one would imagine that his life had been one long struggle with obstacles. Born in Charlton, a little county town in Hertfordshire, January 19, 1813, he received the rudiments of an education like other boys in the neighborhood. His father, Anthony Bessemer, an inventor, seeing that his son was inclined to mechanics, bought him, in London, a five-inch foot lathe and a book which described the art of turning. Day after day, in the quiet of his country home, he studied and practiced turning and modeling in clay. At 18 years of age, he went to London, knowing no one, he says, and myself unknown, a mere cipher in a vast sea of human enterprise. He soon found a place to work as modeler and designer, engraving a large number of original designs on steel with a diamond point for patent medicine labels. A year later, he exhibited one of his models at the Royal Academy. His inventive brain and observing eye were always alert in some new direction. Having ascertained that the government lost thousands of pounds annually by the transfer of adhesive stamps from old deeds to new ones, he determined to devise a stamp which could not be used twice. For several months, he worked earnestly, at night after his daily tasks were over, and in secret, thinking how richly the government would reward him if he succeeded. At last he produced a die of unique design, which perforated a parchment deed with 400 little holes. He hastened to the stamp officials to show his work. They were greatly pleased, and asked him which he preferred for his reward, a sum of money or the position of superintendent of stamps with a salary of three or four thousand dollars a year. He delightedly chose the latter as that would make him comfortable for life. There was another reason for his delight. For being engaged to be married, he would have no solicitude now about daily needs. Life would flow on as smoothly as a river. At once he visited the young lady and told her of his great success. She listened eagerly and then said, Yes, I understand this, but surely, if all stamps had a date put upon them, they could not at a future time be used without detection. His spirits fell. He confessed afterward that, while he felt pleased and proud of the clever and simple suggestion of the young lady, he saw also that all his more elaborate system, the result of months of toil, was shattered to pieces by it. What need for 400 holes in a die when a single date was more effective? He soon worked out a die with movable dates and with frankness and honor presented it before the government officials. They saw its preferableness. The new plan was adopted by Act of Parliament, the old stamps were called in and new ones issued, and then the young inventor was informed that his services as superintendent of stamps at $3,000 a year were not needed. But surely the government, which was to save half a million dollars a year, would repay him for his months of labor and thought. 
Associations, like individuals, are very apt to forget favors when once the desired end is attained. The premier had resigned, and after various promises and excuses, a lawyer in the stamp office informed him that he made the new stamp of his own free will, and there was no money to be given him. Sad and dispirited, and with a burning sense of injustice overpowering all other feelings, says young Bessemer, I went my way from the stamp office, too proud to ask as a favor that which was indubitably my right. Alas, that he must learn thus early the selfishness of the world. But he took courage, for had he not made one real invention, and it must be in his power to make others. When he was twenty-five, he produced a typecasting machine, but so opposed was it by the compositors that it was finally abandoned. He also invented a machine for making figured Utrecht velvet, and some of his productions were used in the state apartments of Windsor Castle. A little later, his attention was accidentally called to bronze powder, he having bought a small portion to ornament his sister's album. The powder, made in Germany, cost only 22 cents a pound in the raw material and sold for $22. Here was a wonderful profit. Why could he not discover the process of making it? He worked for 18 months, trying all sorts of experiments, and failed. But failure to a great mind never really means failure. So, after six months, he tried again, and succeeded. He knew little about patents, had been recently defrauded by the government, and he determined that this discovery should be kept a secret. He made a small apparatus and worked it himself, sending out a traveling man with the product. That which cost him less than one dollar was sold for eighteen. A fortune seemed now really within his grasp. A friend, assured of his success, put fifty thousand dollars into the business. Immediately, Bessemer made plans of all the machinery required, sent various parts to as many different establishments, lest his secret be found out, and then put the pieces of his self-acting machines together. Five assistants were engaged at high wages under a pledge of secrecy. At first he made 1,000% profit, and now, in these later years, the profit is 300%. Three of the assistants have died, and Mr. Bessemer has turned over the business and the factory to the other two. The secret of making the bronze powder has never been told. Even Mr. Bessemer's oldest son had reached manhood before he ever entered the locked room where it was made. For ten years, the inventor now turned his attention to the construction of railway carriages, centrifugal pumps, etc. His busy brain could not rest. When frequent explosions in coal mines occasioned discussion throughout the country, he made, at large expense, a working model for ventilating mines and offered to explain it to a committee of the House of Commons. His offer was declined with thanks. A little investigation on the part of great statesmen would have been scarcely out of place. At the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, he exhibited several machines, one for grinding and polishing plate glass, and another for draining, in an hour, an acre of land covered with water a foot deep. The crowd looked at them, called the inventor the ingenious Mr. Bessemer, and passed on. Two years later, he made some improvements in war implements and submitted his plans to the Woolwich Arsenal, but they were declined without thanks even. Some other men might have become discouraged, but Mr. Bessemer knew that obstacles only strengthen and develop men. The improved ordnance having been brought to the knowledge of Napoleon III, he encouraged the inventor and furnished the money to carry forward the experiments. While the guns were being tested at Vincennes, an officer remarked, If you cannot get stronger metal for your guns, such heavy projectiles will be of little use. And then Mr. Bessemer began to ask himself if he could not improve iron. 
but he had never studied metallurgy. This, however, did not deter him, for he immediately obtained the best books on the subject and visited the iron-making districts. Then he bought an old factory at Baxter House, where Richard Baxter used to live, and began to experiment for himself. After a whole year of labor, he succeeded in greatly improving cast iron, making it almost as white as steel. Could he not improve steel also? For 18 months he built and pulled down one furnace after another at great expense. At last the idea struck him, he says, of making cast iron malleable by forcing air into the metal when in a fluid state, cast iron being a combination of iron and carbon. When oxygen is forced in, it unites with the carbon and thus the iron is left nearly pure. The experiment was tried at the factory in the midst of much trepidation as the union of the compressed air and the melted iron produced an eruption like a volcano. But when the combustion was over, the result was steel. Astonished and delighted after two years and a half of labor, Bessemer at once took out a patent and the following week by request, August 11th, 1856, read a paper before the British Association on the manufacture of malleable iron and steel without fuel. There was great ridicule made beforehand, said one leading steel maker to another, I want you to go with me this morning. There is a fellow who has come down from London to read a paper on making steel from cast iron without fuel. Ha ha ha. The paper was published in the Times and created a great sensation. Crowds hastened to Baxter House to see the wonderful process. In three weeks, Mr. Bessemer had sold $100,000 worth of licenses to make steel by the new and rapid method. Fame, as well as great wealth, seemed now assured when, lo, in two months, it being found that only certain kinds of iron could be worked, the newspapers began to ridicule the new invention, and scientists and businessmen declared the method visionary and worse than useless. Mr. Bessemer collected a full portfolio of these scathing criticisms, but he was not the man to be disconcerted or cast down. Again he began the labor of experimenting, and found that phosphorus in the iron was the real cause of the failure. For three long years he pursued his investigation. His best friends tried to make him desist from what the world had proved to be an impracticable thing. Sometimes he almost distrusted himself, and thought he would give up trying, and then the old desire came back more strongly than ever. At last, success was really assured, but nobody would believe it. Everyone said, oh, this is the thing which made such a blaze two or three years ago, and which was a failure. Mr. Bessemer took several hundredweight of the new steel to some Manchester friends that their workmen might try it without knowing from whence it came. They detected no difference between this which cost thirty dollars a ton and what they were then using at three hundred dollars a ton. But nobody wanted to buy the new steel. Two years went by in this fruitless urging for somebody to take up the manufacture of the new metal. Finally, Bessemer induced a friend to unite with him, and they erected works and began to make steel. At first the dealers would buy only 20 or 30 pounds, then the demand steadily increased. At last the large manufacturers awoke to the fact that Bessemer was underselling them by $100 a ton, and they hastened to pay a royalty for making steel by the new process. But all obstacles were not yet overcome. The government refused to make steel guns. The shipbuilders were afraid to touch it. And when the engineer of the London and Northwestern Railway was asked to use steel rails, he exclaimed excitedly, Mr. Bessemer, do you wish to see me tried for manslaughter? Now steel rails are used the world over at the same cost as iron formerly, and are said to last twenty times as long as iron rails. 
Prejudice at last wore away, and in 1866, the Bessemer process, the conversion of crude iron into steel by forcing cold air through it for 15 or 20 minutes, was bringing to its inventor an income of $500,000 a year. Fame had now come as well as wealth. In 1874, he was made president of the Iron and Steel Institute to succeed the Duke of Devonshire. The Institute of Civil Engineers gave him the Telford Gold Medal, the Society of Arts the Albert Gold Medal. Sweden made him honorary member of her Iron Board. Hamburg gave him the freedom of the city, and the Emperor of Austria conferred upon him the honor of Knight Commander of the Order of Francis Joseph, sending a complimentary letter in connection with the jeweled cross and circular collar of the order. Napoleon III wished to give him the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor, but the English government would not permit him to wear it. The Emperor, therefore, presented him in person with a gold medal weighing 12 ounces. Berlin and the King of Württemberg sent him gold medals. In 1879, he was made Fellow of the Royal Society, and the same year was knighted by Queen Victoria. In 1880, the freedom of the City of London was presented to him in a gold casket, the only other great discoverers who have received this distinction being Dr. Jenner, who introduced vaccination, and Sir Rowland Hill, the author of Penny Postage. In the United States, which gives no ribbons or decorations, Indiana has appropriately named a flourishing town after him. It is estimated that Sir Henry Bessemer's one discovery of making steel has saved the world, in the last 21 years, above $5,000 million. When his patent expired in 1870, he had received in royalties over $5 million, in his steel works at Sheffield, after buying in all the licenses sold in 1856, when the new process seemed a failure, the profits every two months equaled the original capital, or in 14 years the company increased the original capital 81 times by the profits. How wise it proved that the country lad did not obtain the permanent position of superintendent of stamps at $3,000 a year. Rich beyond his highest hopes, the friend of such eminent and progressive men as the King of the Belgians, who visits Denmark Hill, Sir Henry has not ceased his inventions. Knowing the terrors of seasickness, he designed a great swinging saloon, 70 feet by 30, in the midst of a seagoing vessel named the Bessemer. The experiment cost $100,000, but has not yet proved successful. In 1877, when 64 years old, he began to devote himself to the study of Herschel's works on optics and has since constructed an immense and novel telescope which magnifies 5,000 times. The instrument is placed in a comfortable observatory so that the investigator can either sit or stand while making his observations. The observing room, with its floor, windows, and dome, revolve and keep pace automatically with every motion of the telescope. This is accomplished by hydraulic power. No wonder that Bessemer has been called the great captain of modern civilization. He has revolutionized one of the most important of the world's industries. He has fought obstacles at every step, poverty, the ridicule of the press, the indifference of his countrymen, and the cupidity of men who would steal his inventions or appropriate the results. He has earned leisure, but he rarely takes it. His has been a life of labor, prosecuted with indomitable will and energy. He has taken out 120 patents, for which the specifications and drawings fill seven large volumes, all made by himself. The world had at last come to know and honor the boy who came to London at the age of 18, a mere cipher in a vast sea of human enterprise. He made his way to greatness unaided, save by his helpful wife. 
Sir Henry died on the 15th of March, 1898, leaving an immense fortune, which, nevertheless, was not inordinate when compared with the services rendered by him to mankind and a stainless name. The unfair treatment which had embittered his early days had been atoned for by the Queen granting him a title in recognition of his invention accepted by the post office, and he had come to be regarded as one of the greatest benefactors of modern times. Such a life, crowned with such a success, is calculated to be a mighty inspiration to every ambitious youth. End of Chapter 12, Recording by Rosie